Greetings and welcome to the Mahindra Humanities Center. My name is Susanna Clark and I am the Morton B. Knopfel Professor of Music and the Director of the Mahindra Center. It is my great pleasure to welcome you all to today's event featuring Walter Johnson in conversation with Cornell West on the broken heart of America, St. Louis and the violent history of the United States. Walter Johnson, who is the author of today's featured book, is the Winthrop Professor of History and Professor of African and African American Studies at Harvard University. His prize-winning books, Soul by Soul, Life Inside in the Antebellum Slave Market, and River of Dark Dreams, Slavery and Empire in the Mississippi Valley Cotton's Kingdom, were published by Harvard University Press. The book we are discussing today, The Broken Heart of America, was published in the spring of 2020 by Basic Books. His book has already drawn acclaim and has been heralded as, and I quote, a triumph in telling together the stories of settler violence and racism that has, had traditionally eluded historians. And I quote there from the Los Angeles Review of Books. Indeed, he's been named a finalist for the 2020 National Book Critics Circle Awards in nonfiction. Walter Johnson's signature style as a historian, if I may put it that way, is to delve deeply into the history of a particular city or location. But the story he emerges with is very much one of America as a whole. Walter Johnson is also a founding member of the Commonwealth Project, which brings together academics, artists, and activists in an effort to imagine, foster, and support revolutionary social change. And it begins in St. Louis. Cornell West is the Victor S. Thomas Professor of the Practice of Public Policy, uh, Public Philosophy at uh, Harvard Divinity School and the Department of African and African American Studies at Harvard University. He is a nationally and internationally renowned public intellectual, philosopher, political activist, social critic, and author. His most influential books are Race Matters and Democracy Matters. He is a frequent commentator on politics and social issues across media outlets. He has co-hosted radio programs and podcasts, and he's featured in over 25 documentaries and films. In the Matrix series, for example, he plays the role of Counselor West. When the British magazine Prospect published earlier this year, uh, last year their list of the world's top 50 thinkers for the COVID age, they wrote, and I quote, COVID is a disease of the body, but it has redefined the requirements for a great mind. Cornell West was listed as the fourth greatest thinker for the COVID-19 era. We are very honored to have you with us here today, Cornell. So before I turn things over, I have a word about today's format. We will first hear from Walter Johnson, who will provide some context about his book. And then Cornell West and Walter Johnson will hold a conversation together. We will end with questions from you, our audience. Uh, so if you'd like to ask a question, please use the Q&A function uh, in Zoom. You can type your question at any point during the event so you don't have to wait until the question time. And I will disappear now and I will reappear during the question time as a moderator. But without further ado, thank you everyone for joining us on Zoom today for this event. And I hand things over to you, Walter Johnson. Thank you very much, Susie. Um, and thank you to uh, my colleague Cornell West for honoring me by, uh, by participating this evening. Um, I want to just talk a little bit about what I was, was trying to do in the book and then to, to hear from Cornell and to answer some of your questions. Um, the book is a history of St. Louis and I argue of the United States empire um, and of, of capitalism in the United States and anti-Blackness, what I call racial capitalism, um, from more or less the Lewis and Clark up until um, the murder of Michael Brown in 2014. And what I'm trying to, to do with the idea of racial capitalism is to try to think through a, an argument a history of the relationship of imperialism to anti-Blackness to capitalism. 
And so that's the, the thread that, that runs through the book is the history of racial capitalism. And what I, I think that the book tries to do is to first suggest that if we understand the imperial history of the United States, many of the categories that we have used to write the history of the United States need to be reconsidered. Um, we can begin with the category of home, right? I mean, if we are imagining the United States as a settler imperial project, then the notion of home as a refuge, home on the range, is, a, is freighted with violence. Now, this is on one level obvious, and it is on another level, I think, continually erased in our history. So what I try to do is to take that initial commitment to writing the history of the United States as an empire and to, to, to follow that through the history of St. Louis. St. Louis, which I argue was the hub of the United States Western Empire up to the Civil War. It was the site of Jefferson Barracks, which was the headquarters of the Western Division of the United States Army. It was the hub of the the fur trade. And so I try to, to follow that, that idea of St. Louis as the hub of empire through the, the history of the 19th and 20th centuries. And as that history moves forward, um, the, the one of the primary questions of the book becomes about the relationship between the history of imperialism and anti-Blackness in the history of the United States. So the book begins with the fur trade and the way that um, the world of Lewis and Clark, a world that was a, a violent antagonistic world, but a world in which Anglo, not to mention French nor Spanish um, empire had not fully triumphed in North America. It begins with that world and the way that that, that rough world of the fur trade was replaced increasingly over the, the 1820s and, and 1830s with a world that was characterized by um, much more effective and um, consequential uh, US military violence, both settler violence and violence on behalf of the United States, you know, from the, from the United States Army, and culminating in um, patterns of repeated removal of Native Americans, first from the east to the Trans-Mississippi West to Missouri and beyond, and then from Missouri and beyond again and again and again, a pattern of removals that culminated in many cases in um, efforts, self-conscious efforts um, at extermination and, and genocide. Um, the argument then moves to the way that the particular situation of Missouri in the 1820s, which is the situation of a place that was a, um, an outlet for the migration of, of non-slaveholding and white, non-slaveholding white working people from Virginia who were seeking their own kind of society, who were seeking to get out from under the dominion of slaveholders, the way that that particular character of the class migration to Missouri led to a removalist or, or undergirded a removalist attitude towards free black people in Missouri and, 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 and a climate in which slavery was viewed with some suspicion and occasional hostility. Not, I want to emphasize, because most of these white migrants from Virginia were, were sympathetic to enslaved people or wanted to make common cause with them, but because they thought that slavery was at the root of, of um, their own, the, 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 the dominion of slaveholding whites over them, right? Over their, their own, um, their, the limit on their fortunes. So Missouri, the political Missouri was characterized by both a kind of a white supremacist hostility to free people of color, a removalist hostility to free people of color, and 
a tension over the slavery that was in both the city and the, um, the, the St. Louis County and then the larger state of Missouri. The book follows that tension through the Civil War, which was particularly interesting in St. Louis because um, the Civil War conflict in St. Louis was largely pushed along by, and this, this actually has to do a lot with the history of the Civil War in Missouri, by German refugees from the revolutions of 1848 in, in Europe. Many of these refugees were actually themselves communists. So I'm speaking particularly of General Franz Siegel, who was um, the, the leader of the United uh, of, of the Union Army in Missouri at the beginning of the Civil War, and Joseph Wedemeyer, a close friend of Marx and Engels, who was responsible for the artillery defense of the city during the Civil War. And so the Civil War in, um, in St. Louis in particular was a fascinating moment where there was a, a real opening, a real possibility to take a war against slavery and to transform it into a war against property. And it's a period that was characterized by a genuinely revolutionary alliance of these German communists and escaping African-Americans, self-liberated. African Americans. The book suggests that that possibility was eventually foreclosed, um, although it, it, it undergirded the, the, the um, epical, and I, I think that the, the um, general strike in 1877 in St. Louis, which brought together black and white uh, workers, and was the, the first general strike in the history of the United States. That alliance was dissolved under the pressure of both the brutal um, suppression of that strike and the inconsistent ability of white working people to, to make common cause with um, black workers in St. Louis after the Civil War. And I, what I argue then is, is that instead of a genuinely revolutionary Civil War settlement, what happened large, you know, it was, was a, um, a counter-revolutionary Civil War settlement. The counter-revolution of property is what Du Bois calls this period in his famous book, Black Reconstruction, published in 1935. And that that counter-revolutionary counter-revolution of property was in fact an imperial civil war settlement. That it had everything to do with the railroad, everything to do with expansion to the West, and thus everything to do with Indian war, removal, extermination, genocide. I follow that history up through the history of the World's Fair in St. Louis in 1904 and then the East St. Louis uh, Wraith Massacre in 1917. And what I'm trying to do at every stage of the argument is to talk about two things at once. Um, and, and I think that this has caused a little perplexity among some of my, my critics who haven't understood the, the argument about racial capitalism maybe as much as I, I hope they would. I'm trying to talk about changes in the modes of exploitation and extraction, changes in the economy. So the, from the fur trade to the dual labor economy of East St. Louis and forward, I'll, I'll describe a couple more of them in moments. But at the same time to notice that these changes in the economy are accompanied by an insistent removalism in relationship to African Americans, first in relationship to Native Americans and then in relationship to African Americans or really both simultaneously, one could argue through the present. And so I'm trying to track both a kind of a constancy and a, a set of economic changes. From the, um, one of the things that, 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 so for instance, in looking at the East St. Louis race massacre, it is an event that begins as a conflict in the labor market. It begins because, well, it begins with emancipation. It begins with the hopes of 4 million African-Americans, many of them moving up the railways to places like, uh, you know, from Mississippi, from Louisiana, to places like St. Louis, East St. Louis, Chicago, looking for work, right? 
and from what Du Bois calls the failure of organized labor to recognize 4 million African Americans as workers. So although the AFL, the National Labor Organization at that, that point was um, allowed for integrated lo local unions, in East St. Louis, all the locals were segregated. And so when the First World War came around and when um, white workers who were in the plants and had the jobs tried to uh, leverage the increased power of labor during, during the war um, in a strike, they were replaced by, by African-American workers, by people who had been there but not organized by organized labor who were cynically um, employed by, by the, the bosses in East St. Louis. There was then a conflict in the labor market that exploded into a white supremacist um, massacre. But that massacre moved from the downtown. It moved overnight from the downtown on July the 2nd of 1917 out into the neighborhoods. And it became a, an effort to drive the black population of East St. Louis away. And indeed on that night, thousands left East St. Louis. So the book moves from there to a discussion of um, real estate capitalism to various kinds of designs and speculations that um, wealthy people and city fathers um, had in the city of St. Louis um, that, that culminated in the destruction of hundreds, really thousands of acres, um, uh, hundreds of acres hundreds of acres, both along the riverfront and then in the area of civil uh, of St. Louis called Mill Creek Valley. Mill Creek Valley was about 500 acres, about 20,000 people lived there, about 800 institutions, churches, schools, etc. And it was torn to the ground um, in 19, uh, 1959. The idea being that um, the, the one of the, the heart, one of the, the central neighborhoods of Black St. Louis would be torn down and allow for a different kind of real estate-based economic growth. Many of those who lived in Mill Creek Valley, although by no means all of them, because many people were just displaced um, and, and had you know, really, really to, to make do, many of them moved to the pruitt Igo housing project, the most famous, I guess, the most notorious housing project in the, in the world during the, the 1960s and 70s which had been built in 1956. Um, and one of the things that I, I, I try to, to suggest in the Pruitt-Igo housing project is that we see a different model of capitalist exploitation, this time a kind of a military industrial capitalist exploitation where the inhabitants of the Pruitt-Igo project were themselves treated as a sort of resource to be exploited, exploited for knowledge. There were at, at, at some point more sociologists than there were maintenance workers in the Pruitt-Igo housing project, more people studying um, urban poverty than there were people trying to alleviate it. And um, during the, the year 1963 through 65, the federal government, the United States Army Chemical Corps ran a series of secret um, experiments on the inhabitants of the pruitt Igo project by airborne radiological weapons experiments. And so I'm, I'm trying to suggest there yet again, another model, another moment of a different sort, a different motive of exploitation, of extraction, um, and yet one that culminated in another black removal with the, the dynamite, Pruitt-Igo was dynamited beginning in 1972 and the population was again driven out, many of them northwards to North City in St. Louis and to North County to Ferguson. And the book ends in Ferguson and it ends with what I think is a kind of the carceral moment of um, anti-Black of racial, racial capitalist exploitation in the United States. So with things like for-profit policing and payday loans and the ways in which the um, excessive taxation of the um, population through sales tax, through fines, um, through fees um, culminates both in a number of people in, in, 
in outrageous jail sentences for those who don't show up for court dates and also in a um, set of subsidies to um, corporations in the city of St. Louis. That's where, that, that's, that's the sort of story that I set out to tell when I started to write the book. What I found as I wrote the book was a history of what in um, deference to my, my colleague Cornell West, I might call um, a history of resistant prophecy. A, a way that I found that, that radicals and African-American activists and radical African-American activists in St. Louis, I think, um, pointed the way both for their contemporaries in the United States and really for us. And so speaking, you know, I, I talked already about the alliances between communists and self-liberated African-Americans during the Civil War. I write quite a bit about the strike at Funston Nut, which was the largest uh, employer of black women in the city of St. Louis in the early years of the depression. There are 2,500 black women employed at uh, Funston Nut who went on strike in 1933 to have their wages equalized um, with white women on the line and indeed ended up raising the wages for everyone who worked at Funston Nut. And they went on strike in solidarity with one another, but also in organization with the Communist Party in St. Louis, which was at that point quite strong. I write a lot about the Jefferson Bank protest, which was a protest in 1963 um, at a, a, a bank that was very, very near um, Mill Creek Valley in this, this historic neighborhood that I, I talked about. And it was an employment protest, the idea being that, that if Black people are putting their money in this bank, then the teller, you know, the, some of the tellers should be Black, that there should be Black people employed in the bank. And walking up and down in front of, of Jefferson Bank was Herschel Walker. Herschel Walker, who was the Black uh, chair of the Communist Party in St. Louis in, in, in the late 30s and 40s, who was at Jefferson Bank. Walking up and down there really for his first protest was Percy Green, somebody I write a lot about, somebody who is, I think, a, um, I think an overlooked um, giant of the civil rights era. Who, who started on the picket line at Jefferson Bank and went on to, to do some of the most famous protests in the history of St. Louis, including climbing the St. Louis Arch in order to shut down construction on the arch in 1964 and to demand that black workers be employed in the federal project on, this, on the St. Louis Riverfront. Um, and then, then sort of following forward, what I see is, is actually a set of concrete linkages between Percy Green and the activists who came after. Percy Green is a sort of a, a godfather to um, an organization in St. Louis called the Organization for Black Struggle. Organization for Black Struggle is run by, by um, Jamala Rogers, who was a, a terrific figure on the national level of organizing in the, the 1990s, ordered the, the Radical Congress of the, 19, uh, um, of the 1990s. And o Organization for Black Struggle was a kind of, um, not all of the Ferguson protesters, or even not, not, not the, the majority of the Ferguson protesters came out of OBS, but many did. And many were adjacent to OBS. And so right there, I think there's a linkage between you know, one can see a, a linkage, a tradition, what I would call part of the black radical tradition, tying together Herschel Walker, Percy Green, OBS and Jamala Rogers to, to Ferguson. This really came home to me when um, I, I was talking to Percy Green, one of the interviews I did for the book, and I'm gonna start to, to close with this. And in um, 1979, in response to the um, decision of the city of St. Louis to close the Homer G. Phillips Hospital on the north side, the, the hospital that not only served the black population and most of the black population of St. Louis, but was a symbol of black, um, black excellence, a national symbol of black excellence. Um, Percy Green tried to organize a general strike in the city of St. Louis. So when I, when I asked him about that, he looked back all the way to the general strike of 1877. And he said he was trying to operate in the image of, in, in the 
in the tradition of the general strike of, of 1877. And so it is, it's that, that that really came through to me and really um, surprised and indeed heartened me as, as I, um, I wrote the book. And it's a, it's a tradition, I would argue, that, that persists today um, in, in some of the visionary activism in St. Louis um, around closing the workhouse, closing the city's midi medium security um, prison and in organizations like Hands Up United, Action St. Louis, Black Men Build, Dream Defenders, Equal Housing Opportunity Council, all kinds of, I mean, just the fantastic um, sense of, of, of possibility in a city that, that my, um, one of my mentors and, and really tour guides in St. Louis, George Lipsitz calls um, the right city for all the wrong reasons. And so with that, um, I'd like to bring in my colleague, Cornell West. Um, I just like to, to quote Barbara Ransby, another, another hero of mine who recently called Cornell West the people's professor. And I wanna thank him for his, you know, I have a boundless, boundless admiration for Cornell West, for his brilliance, his moral vision, his generosity and his soul craft. And so it really is my, my honor to have him here tonight. Well, my dear brother Walter, I wanna thank you. And of course we wanna thank the leaders of this center for uh, allowing us to have this reflection on this magisterial text. It really is just pioneering, it's sweeping. Uh, and it reminds us of what great history really is. I mean, I, I love just your earlier text, Soul by Soul, River of Dark Dreams. With this third text, you have just outdone yourself. And you are, you, you, I think you've been elevated to the higher echelons of the, uh, the, the long tradition of the great historian, Frederick Jackson Turner, and, uh, 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 Richard Hofstetter, and Ir now Irving Painter, and Eric Foner and Bernard Bale and Oscar Hale, Hanlon, all of those who have taught us to see, and this is very important for uh, our audience, that, you know, there's a wonderful line that Henry James wrote to Robert Louis Stevenson, July 12, 1901. He says, no theory is kind to us that cheats us of seeing, that cheats us of seeing. Now we know James is a novelist, but the great historians even given the constraints of the evidence and so forth, the great historians have a synoptic vision and a synthetic analysis and a synecdochic imagination. I'm using the rhetorical trope of synecdoche, the relation of parts that constitute a whole that's bigger than the sum of the parts. So the great historians, they allow us to see things that earlier historians did not emphasized, overlooked, downplayed, or just rendered invisible. And the great, great spirit and legacy of Harvard's own W.B. Du Bois is at, is at work in your instant classical text. It really is. It's there at the deepest level. And it's not just, I think, at the level of the creative fusion of keeping track of the emergent and expansion of racial capitalism and the ways in which is related to empirical expansion, the ways in which the vicious legacies of white supremacy always changing over time are connecting, but you also stay on the ground with the lived experiences of the persons, the individuals, the agents, the personalities as they wrestle with circumstances not of their own choosing, the structures and institutions which themselves are, are in process. And you see, the, what we, what the, I think when we talk about really in you know, a quest for veritas, a quest for truth, well, one major condition is to allow the suffering to speak, it, it, the voices to speak, the communities to speak, the traditions to speak. And it's not just a subaltern and, and, and dominated, but the ways in which the dominated are them sh themselves shaped by structures of domination. And some of the voices that come out of those communities are complicitous with those structures of domination. You got some wonderful moments when you talk about the role of black leadership being complicitous with the various bargains and compromises that capital makes with those particular leaders as black poor and black working people are sacrificed. Their needs are pushed to the edges, as it were. 
And so I, I won't go on too long here, but I, I do want to stress just how pioneering this text is. That at this point now, this is the best history we have of the spirit of Du Bois that builds on the insights of what came before, but it's zeroing in on empire. It's zeroing in on predatory capitalism, but zeroing in on regionality. Who would have thought that you could tell a definitive story of racial capitalism and the empire through the lens of St. Louis? I mean, that, that, that's a regional shift. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it, it's like Handlin saying, I want to talk about the city and the immigrants, and Turner's been talking about rural uh, uh, frontiers and so forth. No, this is, this is a major shift. So now, what is the relation of land and the labor and the changing modes of production and the relations of production and the various ideologies, the dominant one of white supremacy? Those become important. And yet you never lose sight of the humanity of not just the subjugated, but even those who are doing the subjugating, the stories of Thomas Hart Benton. We need a lot more inquiry into his role. And, and, and you, you, you point out the night side and, and the dark side of, the way, of his life and how he's able to get away with it. Already you have ruling class elites who can say and do anything with no accountability, no answerability, no responsibility whatsoever. Similarly so with William Harney. Similarly so with, with Bartholomew. What, what's the Harlem, Harlem of Bartholomew? Yes. You know, the city planner, the urban planner, not just in St. Louis, he becomes a national one. That becomes a model for urban renewal, black removal, pushing out poor working people across the nation. And you talked about Jamala Rogers, of course. You got Mother Tef Poe there as well. You got Charles Keen there, the Black Liberators, their crucial role. The movie that just came out on Fred Hampton and the killing, the COINTELPRO and so forth. You think of the various attacks and assaults on Charles right there in St. Louis. Once he's moved from Cairo, Illinois, run out of Cairo, run out of St. Louis, back to Cairo, lucky to be alive, beaten over and over again. And so the levels of, of, of violence that we tend not to want to see when we tell our overarching narratives of the United States. It's not a pretty picture, but at the same time, there are some emancipating elements there because the resistance or resilience is overwhelming at the very end. I mean, I must say it, it almost brought tears to my eyes, brother. I know I'm kind of sentimental, brother, you know. But when you ended with uh, uh, with those young kids striding, because I was a track star when I was when I was young. Those young kids striding with the strider with Sister Camille. Mm -hmm. her, her boy's already been shot. She's already had to deal with unbelievable, overwhelming adversity in that 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 it, 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 in St. Louis that sense of we're still rising, we're still resisting. Mm. I wanna just end with a question. Could you say more? And one of the things that's mind blowing about this text is that the genealogy you tell of the authoritarian populism of the neo-fascism in St. Louis, of Gerald Smith, yeah. of Pat Buchanan, of James Earl Ray's brother. James Earl Ray is of course, supposedly the person that killed our dear brother Martin Luther King Jr. You probably have some cooperation, but we won't go into that. But he's there in St. Louis. Phyllis Schlafly's there. And of course, we just lost brother Rush. Rush just right down the road growing up in Missouri. Could you say more about that kind of emergence in light of this magnificent and marvelous inquiry and narrative, story and uh, 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 study, mm. and that's what history is really. It's the fusion of inquiry and narratives. It's the fusion of stories and at the same time studies. Mm. That's what you've done here, it's magnificent brother. Thank you. And I, I appreciate the um, both the detail with which you read the book and with which you reminded me of the things that I should have talked about when I was talking about the book. 
you know, I mean, part of what you, you reminded me of is, is that one of the reasons, one of the things that, that I was very lucky in um, was in coming to St. Louis was coming to a place where a lot of people had done really, really good work in the past. Mm. So, you know, I, I want to make sure that, that, that to, to acknowledge that. Um, Colin Gordon with Mapping Decline, Citizen right. Brown, right. Fiona Irvin's Gateway to Equality, Clarence Lang's Grassroots of the Gateway. I, I, I think Clarence Lang is, um, for me, unparalleled among 20th century American historians. And Grassroots of the Gateway is, is a brilliant, brilliant book. Jody Rios' recent book, Black Lives and Spatial Matters. Um, I also, I, I need to just make sure to thank my research assistant, Mark Lohr, who, you know, I mean, a, a lot of this is, is um, you know, to, to being honest about it, it, it's as much in some places, Mark's vision of St. Louis is mine, so I really need to, to, to lift him up. Um, Benton is hugely important. Right, Benton is um, the the com, you know the common man's common man. Benton is the the I think the intellectual father of both the white man's empire and Pacific Empire in the United States. He starts talking about an empire, a Pacific Empire in the United States in, in 1822. That's right. And he's someone who is a a continual supporter of Indian removal. But he's also, he's the architect of the notion of giving away the public domain to, to white migrants, right? Okay. And so it's, it's Benton who is, I think, um, in, in many ways, um, right there along with Jackson as the kind of architect of, of white man's democracy, which is to say um, racial capitalism and um, uh, Native American removal, extermination. Harney, right? You mentioned William Harney. There is, I, th I think, no more odious character in the, in the history of the United States than, than William Harney, and that's really, really a distinction. There is also a um, state, you know, there's a, there, I'm not sorry, there's not a state named after William Harney, but there is that long, that long a street. street. That long street, street in St. Louis, St. Louis, St. Louis uh, named after William uh, Harney, who's a man named after. Yeah, who who murdered an enslaved woman in his household in in 1834, um, was perpetrated what, according to any modern standard, are horrible war crimes in the Second Seminole War and then in a war against the, the Sioux in in the 1850s, was known among the Sioux as as woman killer. Um, and Harney, for me, you know, raises an interesting question, which is that, that I do think is important, is, is that we have in our, in our society a, um, we have a vibrant discussion about monuments and historical monuments, and we have a critical discussion about Confederate monuments. One thing, and, and this is to come back to this notion of what happens if you take the history of empire seriously, Right. One of the things that, that we learned from the history of St. Louis is that many of those who were heroes of the Civil War, whether that's John C. Fremont or whether that's Nathaniel Lyon, whether that is, is Harney's not really a hero, but whether it's William Tecumseh Sherman or whether it is Abraham Lincoln, were the architects and executioners of Native American removal. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Speaking of, of Lyon and Fremont, who are heroes in, in the, the military history of the Civil War in Missouri, were, were undoubtedly by any modern standard war criminals. And of course, the, the, you know, some of the signature achievements of the Lincoln administration, the Republican Party during the Civil War, the, um, the Merle Act, the Homestead Act, and the, and the Transcontinental Railroad Act. Well, these are the moral act. These are expropriative, imperial, and ultimately exterminatory actions. So that, that's, that's really what I'm trying to get at when I say that, that our categories, our categories like freedom are structured in dominance. I think that's just what, what, what right. you were, you're suggesting. Okay. Charles Cohen, right? Charles Cohen and the Black Liberators. Again, an extraordinary, along with the, the history of Percy Green, the Black Liberators were a Black self-defense organization in St. Louis who were brutally put down by the, the police, 
Cohen himself went to Cairo and and um, has a whole you know there's a whole history in Cairo of really really extraordinarily violent confrontations between black nationalists and the Klan in Cairo Illinois through the through the 1970s and Cohen is someone who um, just recently died I think he died in in 2000 and, and 18. You talked about the Mac Roach uh, album. That's right. There's a, a Max Roach Max Roach did a, a song. In, in yep. remembrance yep. of, oh, of Charles Cohen, right. but then I, I do really want to. Um, I want to. I, I want to also just really appreciate that you talked about the RC Striders. The RC Striders are are a track team on the north side of St. Louis, um, run by. I try to finish the book with a set of images right. Of, right. of mutual aid, really, of of people right. in St. Louis who are. Um, finding new ways to, to, to love one another, to support one another, to flourish amidst the, um, the really, really extraordinarily dreadful circumstances politically, economically. Um, the, the, you know, the, the, the police department in, in St. Louis is, is, the, um, is the most murderous in the nation. Right. And so um, Camille Carr is a woman whose son was was killed by the St. Louis police who runs a track team for kids. And the, and the kids, they, they don't need to recruit. The kids just come, um, they see people running at Normandy High School, Normandy High School on the north side, which was um, Michael Brown's high school. And they see, they see people running and they go out and run. And it is, you know, reminiscent not only of you as a track star, which I, I didn't know, but anybody who's seen you, you know, move down the street, <laughs> I guess, would know. But, uh, of Dick Gregory. Right, That's of, right. Of, of the 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 That's right. you know utterly singular, utterly singular comedian and activist Dick Gregory, about whom I, I write a lot, who um, joined the track team, um, joined the, the high school track team because uh, he needed to be able to find a place to shower. Right, he needed to shower in the, in the early fifties. Um, so, but yeah, I I do think that that. The, where, where you finished is, is in some sense, um, got to be on all of our minds. And it is about the, um, the history of St. Louis and, and I think the history of the Midwest really in um, fostering this sort of virulent strain of um, white supremacy that that we see, you know, more and more around us. I mean, and you know, the the the, the last figure in that series that you outlined, Gerald A. L. K. Smith, um, up to John Stormer, right? Rush Limbaugh from Springfield, Pat Buchanan at the Globe Democrat, Phyllis Schlafly. The last figure would be the Gateway Pundit. Right, it's, it doesn't seem to me to be an accident that the Gateway Pundit is in St. Louis, and and nor really does it seem to me to be an accident that that Josh Hawley is from Missouri. And so, what I, I do see that as as a tradition. I see it as a tradition that is, um, in some degree, the tradition of the notion of Missouri or the West as the white man's country a place where white people should share deeply in um, the, the results of empire and expropriation. And, and I guess for me, one of the interesting things is, is I see that confrontation in Ferguson, right? It, it, it's, you know, as, as I sort of started to, to think historically, it didn't seem to me to be an accident that it was Ferguson. It seems mm. to me to be that it's it's St. Louis where you have both that tradition of of the kind of white supremacist extractivism and entitlement that buries burrows into the suburbs, and mm. also this tradition of black radicalism. And to be honest with you, then it didn't seem to me to be a surprise that in the fall of 2015, that a lot of what we were talking about was what happened at the University of Missouri in my hometown, right? Oh, yeah. In Columbia, really? Missouri. Again, right. a place where you have that, that, that kind of coming out of St. Louis, that traditional black radicalism 
and coming out of the state of Missouri and, and likewise coming out of St. Louis, this kind of deep, deep xenophobic conservatism. And, and really, you know, if, if we think about national politics, that's what I see in the kind of um, the really interesting, you know, confrontation, I would say, between Cori Bush and Josh Hawley on the national level. Right. Hey. Again, you know, Hawley is not himself from St. Louis. He's from from the western part of Missouri. But Cori Bush from St. Louis, you know, really, really um, representing that kind of radicalism. And, and you know, and I suppose in, in the end, I, I have to be honest that, you know, you, you said, well, isn't it extraordinary, right? Isn't it extraordinary to have a history that that puts Missouri and St. Louis at the center at the of American center. history? And that's you know that that that's part of it, it it's very very basic it's very basic but that is a part of my purpose is to say to people look you know you, you can't sleep on missouri you can't sleep on st louis because it's st louis that gave us cory bush it's st louis that gave us ivory perry it's st louis that gave us dick gregory it's st louis that gave us you, you, I mean, we're gonna have to quarrel with Arkansas about Maya Angelou, but right, you, you could, right, you know, right, but, right. No, but, that's true. Um, but yeah. all the way, you know, all of the, the unbelievable historical greatness that, that's come out of there, and that, that I think is to some degree um, understated, it, it, it's under memorialized in the city of St. Louis, but I think it is also hasn't really been recognized, you know, it, it's seen as kind of uncanny that all these things happen in Missouri. Well, you know, why, why is it that the Missouri Compromise, Dred Scott, Jones versus Meyer, Shelby versus Kramer, Green versus McDonald, why is it that all these central civil rights cases are from St. Louis? Right? Well, that, that's really, in a way, what, what I'm trying to mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and, and you shouldn't forget that uh, Donnie Hathaway, the genius that he was, he wrote one of the anthems, Someday We'll All Be Free, straight, straight out of St. Louis. That this is what made me more nervous about anything about this conversation with you was my inability to really keep up with the music. So I, I just have to. <laughs> well, you got you got Miles Davis. You got Miles, Miles Davis in there, right? Yeah, right, yeah. But for those for those of you who tuned in for for someone who has a deep knowledge of the musical history and the black musical history of St. Louis, I give you Cornell West. <laughs> <laughs> that would be, but I just want to thank you. I know we would probably want to open it up now yeah. for questions and queries. But yeah. So let's let's go ahead and and maybe we can get. Um, Susie Clark to, to curate some questions. Again, Cornell, thank you so much. My thank friend. you, thank you, wonderful. Thank you indeed, both of you for that fantastic conversation. And we have a lot of uh, uh, really great questions as well as many questions that begin with compliments to both of you. Uh, and well, let's start with some of, some of those. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed, yes. So, and, and what I also thought I would do is uh, we have a number of members of the audience that judging from the questions are coming from St. Louis. So I thought I would start with somebody who uh, um, is, is, is from there. So this person starts with, thank you so much for sharing this work. I'm from the St. Louis area, specifically my mom and grandma are from East St. Louis. Many folks from St. Louis don't know much of this history and may not be term familiar with terms like imperialism and so on. Uh, so how do you ensure that the book uh, is uh, accessible for the average person? And is any of this work going to inform East St. Louis or St. Louis public education or curriculum? And I'm going to tie in a related question to that one as well, which says, I'd be interested to know how or whether the contents of Mr. Johnson's uh, text and research is being used to inform local government and questions of racial justice in contemporary St. Louis. Those are both very important questions. Yeah. Um... So I, I think, and, and what, you know, the, the readers would have to be the judge of this, right? But what I tried to do in this book was to um, try to teach people what I mean by racial capitalism 
and to try to be very, very specific about that, but to do through, do that through demonstrating it at the scale of ordinary, you know, everyday life. And I think that, you know, to be honest with you, I, I'll just be totally honest with you. There was a long period of time where people would say, well, what's the argument of your book, right? Because I'm a, I'm a professor and so my book has to, to have an argument. And, and I would say over and over again, the argument of my book is, can you fucking believe this, right? Because the, the history is so extraordinary both the, the, the history of violence and the history of the resistance. And so I do think that the, the history itself, the, the extraordinary history made by people in St. Louis is where the answer to that question lies. And I've tried to, to, to tell a lot of stories and to, to tell stories in a way that um, at, at a human scale of, of storytelling. So I hope that, I hope that the, the analytical language is, um, you know, can be sustained, but that it's motivated by the storytelling. I have talked in, over the last year, one of the really, really um, great things that's happened to me is I've talked to a lot of teachers and um, other people doing other kinds of work in St. Louis. And so I do hope that those, those conversations have both help people um, organize some of their thoughts about the city and given them resources to look, for, to, to look, look further. I haven't done any events with teachers on um, on the, the East Bank and in Metro East, um, although I, I'd be happy to. Um, I have done some, been part of an extraordinary project there run by the Equal Housing Opportunity Council and Equity Legal Services in Centerville, Illinois. And so if you want to, to learn about that project and that work, um, there was a recent article in The Guardian about it and there's a website called Flooded and Forgotten, which is maintained by the Centerville the Centerville Residence Committee, but but I I do hope that it's um, I do hope it's a book that that people you know educators and and other um, others in St. Louis and in, in the in the political class read and 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 think about. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, if I say I, I really you know the the real audience for this book for me. Um, honestly, were, were some of my friends and the people who helped me, Percy Green, Jamala Rogers, Tef Poe, the, the, these are people who are to me um, heroes. And I wanted to write a book that would both help me be in a conversation with them and that they would find interesting and, and useful to read. That's, that's really the, the sort of standard that I was trying to achieve. I would just add briefly, though, that in addition to the explanatory power of the book uh, and the interpretive power of the book, that it's so beautifully written. It's not a lot of jargon. It's not a lot of nomenclature. That there's, there's a power that comes through the clarity. And there's a complexity in that simplicity. So it's, it's simple, but it's not simplistic. So that and that prose drives the text. I mean, it's it's a nice sized book now, so you got to spend some time on it. But it, but it it drives it in that way, so it's accessible to the quote unquote ordinary reader, as it were, or what Virginia Woolf would call the common reader, and that's very important to highlight. It it did take me until this point in my life to realize that it is harder to make complicated things seem simple than it is to make simple things seem complicated. Well stated. <laughs> well, that's true. That's true. <laughs> so another question here is uh, whether you could, uh, and perhaps both here, speak um, a bit more about the Metro uh, uh, St. Louis region and how the events that you've discussed played out uh, geographically or how the region's geography that is, you know, on the Mississippi and sharing a border with Illinois, for example, is considered in your work. And this person gives a little uh, bit of their biography, which is they've lived uh, for years in Alton and was an undergraduate at SIU, uh, so Southern Illinois University, uh, Edwardsville, 
during Ferguson. So I'm interested in how significant St. Louis has been for the, re re uh, the region culturally and politically. And they apologize if this is a bit off topic, but they thank you for your work. And that's not off topic. It's, no, it's not. I pose the question. <laughs> so just, just Alden, you know, we need to talk about Elijah Lovejoy, right? Elijah Lovejoy, the anti-slavery martyr who was murdered in, he was an anti-slavery editor, murdered in Alton when his, his printing press was destroyed and thrown into the river. That's what I learned when I was growing up in, in school. Now it turns out, that Lovejoy had been in St. Louis. And the reason that he had left St. Louis is because he had written a series of editorials about the lynching of Francis McIntosh in 1836. And Francis McIntosh was a free black seaman who was um, taken up by the police as he was walking along the levee and being taken up by people wearing no uniforms who he didn't know, he stabbed one of them to death on the levee was taken to jail, was then taken out of the jail and was lynched in what is arguably the first sort of, I don't even wanna go into it, but lynching of that sort in the United States. A grand jury was convened and in, in a pattern that, that one could argue would become familiar later in the history of St. Louis found that no one was to blame for the murder of Francis McIntosh. And Lovejoy editorialized fiercely about that. And it was that that drove him to Alton where he was then later murdered and his, his press thrown into the river. The, I, I, um, I gotta admit, you know, I would have to, to I, I cannot say that the book is as consistent about telling the story of Metro East, the East Bank, Illinois, East St. Louis, as it is about telling the story about St. Louis, Missouri. But, it is important, I think, to talk about East St. Louis and the way that East St. Louis functioned because of its um, location across the river outside of the state of Missouri as a kind of an industrial suburb of the city of St. Louis. And this, the, the city of East St. Louis was a city that had been invented to have no laws, right? A city where there were to be no taxes and there were to be no environmental regulations. It was a place that plants the, the you know, and, and all the, the corporations, uh, all the major corporations of that era, whether it's Standard Oil or, or Monsanto or Armor Meatpacking or Swift Meatpacking or the uh, Aluminum Ore, which is where the strike that started, touched off the, the massacre began later, latter day Alcoa. All of them had plants there. And it was basically the municipal status of East St. Louis was to enable um, capitalists on a, on a national and even a global level to suck wealth out of East St. Louis and to suck wealth out of the West, right? This is where we would reach to the question of empire. We would reach to the question of East St. Louis as an imperial hub and to the, the why, why is it a meatpacking center? Well, it's a meatpacking center because Western agriculture is increasingly focused on, on raising cattle to, to turn into beef. And so that's, you know, so that is a part of the story. Then there's another story, which is the story of the relationship between St. Louis City and St. Louis County that I try to track. And I try to track mm -hmm. that, the, the, what's called the, interestingly, the Great Divorce in 1876, which was the drawing of a hard boundary between the city and the county. So today, St. Louis is its own, own county. It's St. Louis City County. That has made it difficult for the city of St. Louis, it's made it impossible for the city of St. Louis to do what many other cities do, which is to annex revenue outwards, to spread by annexing revenue, by annexing things that are built on its margin. Right, and that set up a very peculiar dynamic in St. Louis, um, where the county then became a, a place initially of uh, a site of white flight. People could go to the county um, and incorporate cities, and many of those cities were incorporated with zoning codes and minimum lot sizes that made it impossible for. Um, African Americans um, and, and poor white people to move to the county. 
Um, and so it's a site of suburbanization. It's a site of, of federally subsidized suburbanization through the, the um, post-war period, right? Increasingly, after um, you know, after various kinds of um, very, very um, consequential and difficult fights by middle class African Americans to to integrate the housing market in the county, increasingly poor and working class people. Black, black people were able to move to the county. And so that's that's mostly in North County. And that's the, the sort of the population of, of places like Ferguson today. Mm -hmm. You know, just very briefly, I was in East St. Louis just before the uh, shutdown. We had the celebration of uh, Eugene Redmond, who was the poet laureate. He's my very close friend. He was a good friend of my father. And we had the Huntland brothers, Warren and Reginald right there from East St. Louis towering pioneers in black film. You can't talk about Wave of Spike Lee and others without talking about Reginald House Party and uh, head of BET and goes on and on and on. So that's crucial. But the story you tell of North side of St. Louis now, that's multi-layered over mm -hmm. time, powerful. So there's a specificity in terms of the certain sections and sectors. That's of the city that you that you highlight, right? But I know we've got the next question. No, there was a, a very detailed class geography to, yeah. to Black St. Louis as well as uh, right. to White St. Louis. That's true. There will be one person who's very grateful that you brought up uh, about the uh, uh, the divorce of, of the county from the city because that 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 was a question uh, that we that we had, and so there's a. Uh, a related question actually to something else you just brought up. And that is, what is the role now of the sort of anchor institutions? So for example, Wash U, uh, SLU, the hospitals, Bayer, uh, Anheuser, and so on in restorative justice as it relates to this racial uh, capitalism and exploitation, or is that actually even the point? Um. I think that that's a question about large institutions like the one at which I teach in relationship to um, restorative justice and, and inequality. And I think on the balance um, in relationship to the cities that they inhabit, universities and, and hospitals are takers rather than givers. Um, and that's, that's a hard thing to say as, you know, but I think that's something that that these are nonprofit um, institutions that that do not pay a lot of taxes and that that hold a lot of, of real estate. And so I don't, I don't want to simply ask, answer that as a question about Wash U or or St. Louis University. I want to answer that as a question about about Harvard and the role that we play here because I think it's incumbent um, upon you know I mean it, the, the, there's a part of me that's still a Missourian enough to understand those people who write really, really nasty Amazon comments and sometimes send me hate mail that are like, you know, why don't you attend to your own stuff in Massachusetts? Why are you picking on us? And so, so I do, I wanna say that, that, you know, this is an issue with, with universities. There are wonderful people at WashU doing wonderful work and the same at SLU and the same at, at Harris Stowe and at SIUE and all the other institutions there. Um, and and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm actually teaching a class focused on, on mapping and restorative justice with a couple of colleagues at WashU this, this um, this term. And so I guess the way that I answer that question is, is I realize a little bit um, less specific than maybe the posing question is that universities, I think, provide, um, if you think about a university as a political economic institution, then I'm not certain that, you know, the, the, the balance sheet is not very good. And DeVere and Baldwin, among others, has really, Gerald Frug, my colleague at the law school, have argued about this very, very strongly. I think if you think about a university as a collection of people, right, as a network of people, then many of the students at WashU and some of the faculty, SLU, Harris Stowe, SIUE, Harvard, are doing wonderful things. 
and and I think um, you know, and and that's what what makes me hopeful. Now they're doing things that that I think in many cases work across the grain of the university rather than simply um, in its in its mm. image. Mm. Well, I would want to assure your friends in Midwest that Brother Walter is in the, on, in the vanguard of fighting for truth and justice here at Harvard and here in Massachusetts. So he's got a consistency across region that needs to be highlighted. I appreciate it. I can that. testify, I can testify to I that. I appreciate it. But I do also want to just note very briefly how uh, Afrofuturism, which is one of the most important uh, movements uh, is, is, is one of the most important sites is actually at the Black College there in St. Louis and Stowe. With Harris, Stowe. Henderson. Yep. Harris Stowe with, with, with yep. Henderson and others. I was just blessed to write a blurb for their latest one, their latest text. And so again, you say to yourself, wow, how did we overlook all of this? My God. And one thing I noticed in your last chapter, though, it looked as if St. Louis University was providing a certain support for the sweet potato brother Yes. And other crucial activities. So the Catholics seem to be playing some role here, even though you were speaking in terms of their structure and institution, not just the philanthropic activity. Fantastic, but, fantastic. But, but so, that I philanthropic mean, activity University, is undergirding some of that. You, you can take a one, one look at SLU and you can see that institution which moved into the land cleared in, in Mill Creek Valley. Right. Right. You can take another look and you see Brendan Rodiger at the, the law clinic, who's been one of the most consistent defenders of, of radical people, black people, disenfranchised people in the city of St. Louis through the through the law, law clinic at SLU. Right. Or you can see their support for the Sweet Potato Project, which I argue is a visionary project uh, founded by a man called Sylvester Brown Jr., which was a an inspiration to me to use abandoned lots in St. Louis to, to help kids learn to cultivate sweet potatoes, turn the sweet potatoes into flour, bake cookies in eventually in a um, in what's called the North City Food Hub, which was partially supported by SLU. Sylvester Brown Jr. is, is a person who, I mean, it, it changed, I, I don't know if I could say he changed my life. I, I would say he changed my life, but but he changed the way that I think about everything when I heard him give a talk where he said, people say we're poor. People come to St. Louis and they say we're poor. And, and you can't go to St. Louis and drive around North St. Louis without seeing the material evidence of abandonment, right? But Sylvester Brown says, we are rich. Look at our children. And for me, that that's the spirit that I see in in a, in a lot of St. Louis. That's that's the extraordinary kind of vision and hope, and just just people who were just just kind of getting on with figuring out ways to support one another and and move forward. I think uh, I would echo what uh, Cornell was saying that about you know your your work sort of from Harvard outwards, uh, Walter. And I'm wondering if you can actually tell us a little bit about uh, your initiative that you founded with uh, and the work you've been doing with, with Tef Poe, because I think that is an example of how institutions, you know, such as Harvard, but others too, um, can work outwards to, towards um, uh, bringing about solutions to our world problems. Anyway, yeah, you know, I mean, tell us a bit more about that. I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a tiny, tiny little piece of, of that, I think. I mean, the, the real thing that, that happened was that we were able to, to have Tuff here for, for what turned into two years, the first year in the, the Warren Center's American Democracy Project, the second year in the, the Hutchin Center's um, Nazir, the Hip Hop Archives, Nazir Jones Fellowship. And over that time, I came to, to know Tuff quite well. and. Um, became quite close to him. He is a, an artist, a rapper from St. Louis and, and an activist, one of the, um, you know, one of the real frontline figures in the Ferguson uprising, somebody who, you know, um, I think the, the, the Cornell Wasp knows quite well. Always my and, dear yeah, and so over time, you know, <laughs> I started to, if you go to St. Louis, like I said, that, that if you're in North St. Louis, what you see is you see a lot of just, extraordinary architecture 
that is uninhabited. And it's uninhabited because the population of the city has been going down since 1950. I mean, it reached its peak of almost a million in 1950. And now, it, you know, the, the population of St. Louis is now somewhere around, and it's in the 300,000s. It's basically the same size the city was in, in 1870. And so that, you know, as a kind of, a, I guess, working in a Marxian tradition, although a heterodox Marxian tradition, when you, you see that, that what's happened is, is kind of a pushing down, a pushing down, pushing down on the city to the point where there's virtually no barrier to entry for trying to build it back up. You can buy a building in St. Louis right now, uh, like you could go online, you can buy a building for $1,000. Now it might have a tree growing up through the middle of it, but we started to think about that and to think about, well, what would it mean to try to get a hold of a building and to turn that into a kind of a community arts collective. And that's still the dream. Now, it turned out that there were a lot of things that, that I at least had not anticipated. Like, well, okay, if you get a building for $1,000 and it has a tree growing up through the middle, that's a long way from a community arts collective. And there's a lot of money that has to happen in the meantime. And that's not the kind of money that I had access to. But as we started then to try to build capacity to get to that level, partly we worked through Harvard, um, having extraordinary students, just fantastic students go and work with the Equal Housing Opportunity Council there. Um, it's our students who did a lot of the work on the, the flooded and forgotten website that I tried to, to, to direct you all to earlier about Centerville. Our students were out there in rubber boots doing water testing, right, about, about the mm -hmm. water contamination in, in, in Centerville. Our students have done oral histories. They've written articles about this. They've helped to map it. And so I'm, I'm both was enormously proud of this group of students for what they did, but also the way that they built relationships with one another and people in St. Louis taught me something. I learned, you know, it helped me kind of with my moral vision of what was just what was possible, how people could could relate to one another in different ways. Um, and and so, you know, that that's been a big, a big part of my life um, recently has been trying to, to kind of foster and bring those things along. This last year over the the destroyed COVID year, again with Tuff and then a visionary designer. Um, from St. Louis named Dee Nichols, who was the, um, I guess the visionary behind the mirror casket that, that some of you will have seen carried around at various demonstrations in St. Louis, which is now in the Smithsonian. It's a, a casket cover with mirrors that they began to carry to the protests in Ferguson in 2014. Um, and in cooperation with the, the Mindich Center, we put together a fellowship for St. Louis artists, for young black St. Louis artists called the In the City Fellowship. And the idea was to bring, to, to both support some of their work and then to do an exhibit at the Griot Museum on the north side of St. Louis, a historically black museum, um, and then bring that exhibit to Harvard. And, you know, Cornell had agreed to, to come meet the, there was no one who they wanted to meet more at Harvard than Cornell West. And he had agreed to meet them. This, this got derailed by COVID, but now I think, you know, I have to be honest, largely through the D Nichols energy, um, she's, she's kept this going and we're gonna have an online exhibit um, that's gonna open along with a new website for the Griot um, in March. We're gonna have art on the outside of the Griot, I think. So, and then that exhibit is gonna, in some way, um, mm -hmm. come to Harvard. So the, we just, we'll have to meet on the other side, on the other side of the pandemic. We on the other side of the pandemic. I, I am certain together. that the artist will be heartened to hear you say oh, that. Oh, oh, absolutely. No, Brother Taft, for me, he's one of the genuine organic revolutionary artists and intellectuals that we have. It's been wonderful the way you all have, have empowered each other. It's, well, it's, it's been, right. For, really. for me, you know, I, I was very lucky to to make good friends early in St. Louis and to, to have people who were willing to, to vouch for me and, and take me around. And he's working for that boycott with Brother Mordecai. 
Ian Mordecai. They, they work on the board, boycott the, ponds together. And, boycott and journalists. Also, um, Very and, powerful, powerful yeah, work and, they're doing together. Yeah, along with Philip Agnew, who's another oh, yeah, un, another, un, un, no, unbelievable person who they, they're in, yeah, running Black Men Build, working in Black Men Build as a new organization. Great. I have um, maybe a couple more questions. I think we have time for that. Um, uh, and there's been a tremendous number of questions. And of course, I, we, we can't get to them all. But there's a kind of line of questioning that has come up. Uh, and so I'm going to pick one in that line. And it starts with uh, a quote from you, which says, our concepts of freedom are structured in dominance. Uh, and this person says, that's a very useful formulation. Uh, and then asks the question, Thinking about the ways we're trying to uh, think about Black and Indigenous histories of empire and racial capitalist displacement together uh, in ways that have not always been done in the past, uh, and that's a compliment to you. I'm wondering what your research revealed um, of a freedom offered to Black Americans that came tethered to the U.S. empire's Indigenous displacements. In other words, how did the Black actors you encountered in the research for your book make sense of the various structures of domination that condition their struggles for freedom? The, you know, the, the question is, is the answer, right? I mean, it's a terrific question and it, and it gets at, I think, one of the um, core problems with the history of the United States, which is the extent to which um, freedom has been mixed up with the problem of the United States empire. And so the, you know, Du Bois tells wonderfully in um, Black Reconstruction, the history of the United States color troops. Um, well, like former Confederates and like other Union Army veterans, the United States color troops were, were sent to the West to fight Indian wars after the Civil War. And, and so, and there's a kind of a, you know, partly because of the Bob Marley song, but there's a sort of a, a legacy around the Buffalo soldiers that is, I think, more complicated than we have understood. And, and so I, ref, I, I refer to that in my, I mean, Du Bois says it beautifully, right? Du Bois says about about the United States color troops. So this is before the Civil War. He says, look, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm not going to be able to quote this and you'll be able to tell that I am not quoting Du Bois. But he says, <laughs> effectively, we gave you Frederick Douglass. We gave you the greatest orator of the 19th century. And you did not take Black men seriously or Black people seriously until we showed you we could kill white people. And so what he's, he's portraying there, I think, is the, the contradiction of martial freedom, the contradiction of people who are admitted to freedom chiefly through their participation in, in empire. I cannot say, I did quite a bit more work on black soldiers in the United States Army um, in the West than is in the book. And, um, but I, I can't say that I, I you know, I, I would be completely um, out of my depth and beyond any kind of intellectual and moral authority to try to characterize their, their sort of vision of, of their, of, of freedom, right? And of their predicament. Um, ZZ Packer, who is somebody who um, I think now actually she lives in the Boston area, who's a novelist and, and, and story writer who I very much admire, is actually writing a book about the, the Black regiments in the United States Army. And, and I imagine that she will, she will take us there. I mean, one of the paradoxes is that even when you go back to the American Revolution, you know, most of the revolutionaries there had been saturated in the British Empire, and they learned something from that empire, then they turned against it. And similarly, so you think of those those black soldiers in uh, in, in in East St. Louis who just got back from World War One, and they said, "Hey, we fought for the empire, but now they're coming at us. We learned a lot from this empire. We've got now a Socratic moment, a critical disposition that we have to turn against it." I think what is always needed are the poets and those with a moral consistency to say it was wrong from the very beginning. And that's always different than the lived experience of people, but you have to have people who are kind of trying to be constant and consistent in what the vision is, even though people must live lives in the midst of the tension 
and they, there's moments in which there's reversal. That's beautiful because I mean that that in a way closes out that dialectic in a way that's really helpful for me, which in you know to be honest with you that that I had thought of but I haven't quite closed that circle. I think about Percy Green, who was in the United States Army, um, was was then working at McDonnell Douglas, but who characterized the extraordinary actions that he did in St. Louis against, effectively against the empire, as being characterized by the tools that he had learned, the organizational strategies, the discipline that he had learned in the army, and taking that knowledge and, and effectively liberating it. Yeah, when you think you think of Howard Zinn as a pilot, right. dropping bombs and comes back and says, oh, I need to think more critically about this empire, even though he's fighting against, he's fighting Hitler, right? So Jeremiah Wright, he's a Marine, mm -hmm. serious Marine, invested in the Marine project, comes back and has to rethink himself in terms of how I relate to these other suffering per persons and how it connects to my own community, as it were. But I mean, that's just too... No, I love that. I mean, I really, you're setting up my, I was joking with my wife today about the next book I'm writing, which is, is going to be a self-help book. And it's called <laughs> John Brown, Lessons for Leaders. <laughs> oh, but I love that salute to Sister Allison in the back. In, 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 in the acknowledgement, so. <laughs> oh yes, it's family affairs last time. Well, they, they they will appreciate that because really a lot of people to whom I'm related, I think they they actually logged on just to make sure it was true that I actually knew you. <laughs> <laughs> you tell her we are brothers forever, but. <laughs> So I think um, I'm going to ask one last question, and it's sure, I'm going to direct sure. it to both of you. And I think it's sort of a, a, a kind of a perfect place to end. So here's um, one question: Was that um, St. Louis has appeared, although in minor roles, in your first two books, um, Walter? How has your understanding of the city changed over the course of your career? And then another question is: What, if anything, gives you hope about? transformation in this area. And I'd like to ask, obviously, Walter to go first and answer that question. But then Cornell, I'd also like to ask you, you know, what, if anything, gives you hope about transformation in this area, since you've read Walter's book? So I'll start with Walter. Uh, for those yeah, I mean, I, I have been telling students for a long time, honestly, that St. Louis, 19th century St. Louis was enormously interesting because I didn't know much about it. But I knew enough to know that it was at the juncture of the, the Mississippi Valley system and the Missouri Valley system. So at the juncture of um, plantation slavery, imperialism, and you know, fur trade, settler colonial imperialism. And so, you know, so, so I guess that, that that was what I knew. What has changed for me is it's actually, I mean, to be, I don't want to be smarmy about it but it's much greater than what I learned intellectually. In the first instance is that St. Louis is a city that I had been to many, many times as a child, as uh, whatever comes before, you know, all the way up, I had traveled to St. Louis many times. And then it wasn't until two 2014 and the, the murder of Michael Brown that I started to, to really travel in the city because I, I then learned that I have been taking what were effectively bypass routes. And so a lot of the story of my book is actually about, about space and about the management of people and populations in space in a way that I came to realize I had allowed myself to be managed. And so a lot of the learning that I've done has simply been actually learning about a city where I thought I had been and only realized as an adult that I had actually never been to St. Louis, that I had been to a, um, a white supremacist curated racially structured version of St. Louis. Um, but honestly, I've learned a lot, I think morally and, and ethically and politically from the people who I've met there from, from Tough, certainly, and, and from the others, and, and also just to come back to the question of hopeful, just from the, the different kinds of projects 
um, that I try to, to, to think about and write about at the end of the book. Different projects, very locally oriented, not really necessarily focused on the seizure of state power, not even sometimes focused on the seizure of municipal power. Projects that are about people helping themselves and helping one another. Now, engaged in politics, Close the Workhouse is profoundly engaged in politics and supports politicians. Um, and, and so that to me has been inspiring and has changed how it is that I think about how one might do in the world, you know, be in the world and, and really imagining building myself in a tiny way, because I got, you know, I'm, I'm a very, very fallen person in this way, um, into, a, into somebody who can, can build with other people in a very immediate, tangible, loving fashion. You know, and that's, that's what I've learned there. I mean, it's, 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 it's squishy, but that for me has been the most profound thing that I learned writing the book. Great, thank you. And Cornell, if I can hand over, as it were, the last word to you, what, if anything, gives you hope about the transformation in this area? Well, you, you think that two of the towering anti-imperialist figures, the greatest comic novelist produced by the American empire, Mark Twain, mm -hmm. and, and now Brother Walter Johnson in the historiographical sphere, both of them from Missouri, you know, who would have thought <laughs> who would have thought and that what means that no matter what the circumstances are, it could be on chocolate sides, it could be on vanilla sides of the country or town, that if you have a fundamental commitment to intellectual integrity, to moral consistency and a willingness to act courageously and take a risk, that you can make a difference, not in an isolated way, but because you accent the best of your own tradition. He's got Mary Angela, he got Walter Senior, Senior, he got folk who's shaping him, molding him. He got Nell Payne, a towering black sister coming out of California, molding him, shaping him. So we don't want to ever give up on people, but I'm a blues man, so I'm not in any way optimistic. You read this book, and I want to show people this book here. See, the broken heart of America, that's the blues. On intimate terms of catastrophe, that's the blues. And in the face of catastrophe, what do you do? Creativity, compassion, perseverance, endurance, community, solidarity, wit, style, with a smile, but knowing you're not naive. There's a whole lot of pain in here, whole lot of suffering, unbelievable social misery, but they never ever allow that suffering, that misery, that hurt, to have the last word. And that uh, to me is not just American affairs, not just a black or white or red or, or queer or whatever. It's the best that we fallible species can do in space and time. Thank with you. joy, with joy. Thank you, with joy indeed. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Cornell and uh, Walter. And as I said, there were many accolades coming in. So I'm gonna just read two of them because the, these individuals who have joined us today could have put it better than I could. That is, thank you so much, Professor Johnson for your erudition and Professor West for your extraordinary vision. And another person says, it's a pleasure to witness a couple of legends in dialogue. And I absolutely agree. So thank you, Walter Johnson and Cornell uh, West for this uh, conversation on Walter's book titled, and I repeat it again, The Broken Heart of America, St. Louis and the Violent History of the United States, published in 2020 by Basic Books. And again, thank you both for a very stimulating and lively and important conversation. Uh, and I want to thank everybody who um, posed questions and there were more questions as I said than we could ask. So thank you so much for your engagement with today's uh, event. And I wanna give a special shout out to all of those who joined us from the St. Uh, Louis uh, area. Um, thank you so much. Uh, and on behalf of all of us at the Mahindra Humanities Center here at Harvard, uh, thank you for joining us. 
and I hope you have a good rest of your day or evening, wherever you, whatever time zone you happen uh, to be joining us from. Thank you, Walter. Thank you, uh, Cornell. Wow. Take care. Thank you for hitting my parents, man. That, that to me, that's, that's the nicest thing that's happened to me in a long time. I really appreciate that. Uh, you know, they smiling. They smiling for good reason. For good reason. But thank you, Sister Susie, for your leadership. Yeah, thank you very us much. Together. Absolutely. Indeed, indeed. Good evening. Thank you both right, very much. You. You take good care now.